if I can just briefly introduce myself, I'm Nathan Allen. I'm an emergency medicine physician uh, and the director of healthcare ethics here at the clinic. Uh, started here in 2015 along with my wife, Erin Allen, who is a pediatrician. So I think we have a really great event um, planned for this evening, um, hosted by the Billings Clinic Ethics Committee uh, in recognition of National Healthcare Decisions Day, talking about getting the conversation started about end of life care. Now, um, I really want to congratulate everybody here for, for jumping in and for showing up and, and um, coming to an event that could seem a little bit intimidating at first. And when we talk about something like advanced care planning, it sounds really intimidating, okay? But when I think about it and I sort of start to break it down, well, you know, when it's care planning, um, that's really just planning in relation to healthcare. And when we say advance, it means in advance, so in preparation for, not advanced, like it's really fancy and really technical. And well, all planning, almost by definition, is done in advance. And so we could really just call this planning, okay? And what I like about thinking about it that way is that you know, plans can change. And you don't have to plan for every eventuality and you don't have to plan for all of the specifics. But as in healthcare, um, as in life, having some sort of plan um, really helps things go a little bit more smoothly. Uh, and so there's a statistic I'd like to share with people about um, death in America. And that is that if you survey Americans and you ask people that eventually when the time comes where they would prefer to pass, 80% of people would tell you that they would prefer to die at home. In actuality, only 20% of people do. Now, there's a lot of complex reasons for why that happens. But I think that conversations like this and advanced care planning can help close that gap between uh, desires and outcomes. I want to give the caveat to that, that here we're not invested in any particular care choice or in any particular care outcome. The choices that people make uh, around the end of their lives are intensely personal, have a lot to do with how they make decisions, how they value things, um, what's important or isn't important to them. And at Billings Clinic, we care really deeply about our patients and our community's ability to get the most out of their health care and to try to generate parity between their desires and their expectations and the outcome that they eventually get. And so that's what we're starting to talk about today, which is getting that conversation started about what can often be an uncomfortable topic and advanced care planning and end of life care planning. Okay. And to do that, we, I think we have a great event planned for tonight. We've got five panelists uh, who are representing a diverse set of backgrounds and are gonna be sharing a bit of their perspective about the value and how to do uh, these conversations and get them started. And then we're gonna be opening up to a lot of time for questions. And so if there's something that you've wanted to ask, we um, hopefully have brought together a big enough group of people that somebody should be able to help provide that answer for you tonight. Uh, to get things started though, we're gonna start off with a little bit of an improv with two of our ethics committee members. We have Diane Arcava and Alice Golden. They are going to be role playing as a mother and daughter and we will get started with our event. Thank you again very much for joining us. Mom, Mom, Diane, it's so great. I know how busy you are and to take time that we can have lunch like this, it's fabulous. Well, well, I wanted to talk to you about something. What, honey, are you okay? Yeah, I read in the paper there was this uh, event happening at Billings Clinic where they were gonna talk about advanced care planning. I am not going. Don't even bring up that subject to me, please. Okay, but mom, I think it's something we should talk about. Honey, I know you've tried in the past, but you know what to do. And I'm not signing any papers, I'm not getting into any legalese. Mom, I don't know what to do. And I don't want to do the wrong thing. Honey, because I care so much about you and I don't want it to be wrong. You know how I like to get it right? I know, honey, and okay, I'm 72, but I feel young. I, I don't feel I should be thinking about those things yet. And you bringing this up, it makes me fearful. It, I don't want to think about death. I don't want to think about it either. Well, okay. I will think about it, but... <laughs> I'm sure that resonated with a few people. Um, that certainly resonated to some experiences that I've had. 
Um, and with that, wanted to transition into our panel for this evening. And I'd like to introduce our moderator for the panel, uh, Dr. Margaret Beliveau. And uh, to introduce her here briefly, uh, she's had a long and illustrious career, which I will attempt to do some, some justice to. Um, so Dr. Beliveau grew up in Connecticut in the Nagatuck Valley and attended medical school in New York Medical College. After serving in the US Navy, she began one of the first general medicine consultation services in the nation, began raising her five children, directed student clerkships, and was an associate program director for both an internal medicine residency program and a geriatric fellowship at Bay State Medical Center in Springfield, Massachusetts. In 2000, she moved to Minnesota to join the staff of the Mayo Clinic. She worked in the Division of General Internal Medicine and was the education coordinator of the Medicine Consultation Service. Margaret's professional passions include medical education, the breadth of ambulatory general internal medicine, medical consultation and perioperative medicine, and continuing medical education. She was one of the founders of the Mayo Clinic Perioperative Medicine course, now in its 10th year. Dr. Beliveau was an associate editor for both the Alliance of Academic Internal Medicine's textbook for today, Chief Medical Resident, and the Mayo Clinic Internal Medicine Board Review Book. She's been working to establish a perioperative service at Billings Clinic and is a member of the core faculty for the Internal Medicine Residency. So for those of you, for those of you who who didn't pick up on it yet or who haven't picked up on it, my accent is a Connecticut Valley accent, so it's kind of a mix of Boston and New York because I grew up in between the two. So you're either, in my family, a Red Sox fan or a Yankees fan, right? Okay. So we have a great group of panelists here with us today. They come from a variety of backgrounds, a variety of disciplines. We have, again, as Dr. Allen said, we've reserved a lot of time for you all to ask questions. And so I want you to think about your questions, but keep them till the end because everybody's going to have a brief talk. I'd like to introduce the members of our panel. Um, starting in the middle, Dr. Pender. Dr. John Pender is a general surgeon who came here about the same time I did, I believe. He'd been a faculty member at East Carolina University for about 10 years. While he was there, he served on the Ethics Committee. He was an associate residency program director for the General Surgery Residency. His interest in ethics started with his undergraduate education where he majored in religious studies. He'll be talking about the physician's perspective on the importance and the value of advanced care planning. So from our point of view, why is this so important? Ramona Bruckner is right there. She has been a full-time chaplain at Billings Clinic for the last five years. She has graduate degrees in ministry, administration, and counseling. After 30 years in full-time ministry, she returned to Montana to care for her parents who were both diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. She's given leadership to several programs with community agencies in the Billings community and has completed the requirements for board certification in clinical chaplaincy with the College of Pastoral Supervision and Psychotherapy. She is awaiting her appointment for her final oral review with the National Certification Committee, which will be later this year. She will be giving us some snapshots of what it's like to be a chaplain and involved in the end of life planning. Diane Arcava is a licensed clinical social worker, licensed marriage and family therapist, and as you saw, a great improv actress. Um, <laughs> she works with supportive and palliative care at Billings Clinic, and she provides counseling services in private practice. Dr. Nathan Allen, as he told you, joined the uh, Billings Clinic last year. He's an emergency medicine physician and the director of healthcare ethics. He did his residency in emergency medicine and then uh, did a clinical medical ethics fellowship at the McLean Center at the University of Chicago. Before he came to the Billings Clinic, he was at uh, Baylor College of Medicine in Texas. He was a faculty member and directed an educational program for all of the resident physicians in ethics, professionalism, and health policy. He will be talking about what to focus on in the content of conversations with family members. And last, Dr. Irene Lokamp. Many of you may know Dr. Lokamp. She's a, also from Baylor, graduate of Baylor College of Medicine. She completed her residency at the Medical College of Virginia and a fellowship at the Brody School of Medicine. She came here in 2011. She is triple boarded, which is a big achievement, in family medicine, geriatrics, and palliative care. She will be sharing the perspective of a physician who has uh, frequently has these conversations with patients, and she will be discussing 
how to initiate this conversation with your health care provider and the tools that can be used to document these conversations and your wishes. And I believe we'll start with Dr. Pender. Um, thank you all for coming. As a surgeon, I'm often uh, tasked with dealing with what happens when this conversation has not been held. And that is, what would you do if it was your loved one? Uh, and I often tell patients that I was orphaned at age 40 um, when my, my dad died quickly at home. Uh, my mom died slowly of lung cancer and uh, palliative care. And, and so I've really had both ways of having a decision made for me and actually having to make the decision myself. And it, I can't say which was better. Um, but oftentimes I'm tasked with trying to answer that question and, and you can't as a physician because you, I, I get out of bed in the middle of the night and I come in and I'm introduced to the family and the world of emotion that comes with that. And I don't know the patient, but rely upon the family members to know what that uh, family member would want. And, that's, and a lot of times we don't know, so we have to try to figure that out because Healthcare has made a leaps and bounds in advancement over the last 50 years, and that can sometimes be a curse um, in these situations. I mean, we have an artificial heart, artificial lungs, artificial kidneys. We can dialyze people. We can breathe for people. Um, 60 years ago, we didn't have these choices to make. Uh, they were made for us. Um, so we really have to define what our definition of life is and not our definition but the patients and we can't do that for them only the family members can so what I as a physician can do is provide you with best case scenarios you know do, if they've had a stroke we want to place a feeding tube tracheostomy or is this surgery survivable what do they want to go through that long term um, and so it's a it's a difficult uh, task, and when I was in academics, I would, anytime a resident would admit a patient to the hospital, I would ask them, to, you know, did you talk to them about what they want? Because as someone gets sick, your ability to have that conversation rapidly goes away. As soon as you intubate somebody, put them on the breathing machine, they can't talk. If they have mental status changes due to a sepsis, they can't make sense. So really, I, I'm the person at the end of it wishing that that conversation had occurred. Because the grief, the anxiety of losing someone is made that much worse because the conversation has not been held. So I made the mistake of trying to have it with my 13 year old and just made her cry. Yeah. <laughs> so you should wait till they're a decent age before you have that conversation. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Pender. I, I'm always, one of my favorite lines from any movie is a line from the movie Jurassic Park, where the, um, all these dinosaurs are all over the place, and one of the people who's observing says to the owner of, the, of Jurassic Park, your scientists spend so much time thinking about what they could do that they forgot to think about what they should do. And I think that's very true when we talk about advanced care planning. Uh, next, um, Chaplain Bruckner is going to share some thoughts with you as well. Can I take this off the stand? There you go. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's great. Can you hear me okay? What I would like to do as a chaplain is to give you four quick snapshots of some experiences that I've had related to end-of-life decisions since I've been here at Billings Clinic. And um, as you know, chaplains, we have the delightful opportunity to visit a lot of people when they're in the hospital, but often we're called into trauma situations, into, into situations where there's been an accident or or where um, maybe something, a surgery hasn't gone well, or all kinds of situations like that. And so often there's a lot of emotion already 
in the room, as Dr. Pender just, just talked about, for the physicians. The first snapshot that I want to give you is happened not too long ago. It was when I was called in in the middle of the night. There, um, there was a, a person, a, a lady from uh, rural Montana that had been flown in. She was a ranch lady. She had been healthy. She had been on her horse the day before, had been, you know, had, as far as she knew, had pretty good health. And something happened, and she got flown in that night. She was, um, she was a single mom, and she had a son who was in another part of Montana completely. He was a CEO at, a, at, a, um, at his business, and he was 38 years old, and he and his fiance came from the other side of Montana to come and see his mom here at the hospital. By the time they got, they got here, she had passed away. This is, a, everything is worse in the middle of the night. And without going into details, as I was sitting with, with this son and his fiance, his words to me were, what do I do? We talked about everything, but we didn't ever talk about this. And he said, I don't have a clue. I don't know what mom would have wanted. I don't even live in the area she lives in anymore, and I'm not familiar with the resources. And it was just one of those snapshots where you just, you know, you just, he wished that as hard as the conversation was, that he knew what she would have wanted in that situation. A second, a, a second snapshot I want to give you is of a hospice nurse who had been very active in her community. She was retired loved being with her family and her, her young grandchildren, was diagnosed with cancer. This hospice nurse was, like many Montana people, very um, independent and made decisions, always helping someone else, and had dealt a lot with end-of-life issues as a hospice nurse. And her family depended on her to make a lot of those decisions. Well, she was diagnosed with cancer. She got treatment and did well for a while and then started to fail. And it was as she was failing that it came into play where she started to need more and more of her family to make decisions and to provide support. Her husband didn't think, <laughs> he didn't think he would ever lose her. So he, he, had, he just had immense grief and was unable to help with decisions. Her son was away working in the Bakken, so he wasn't really there to help her. That left her, her um, daughter, who had two young children, with the responsibility of trying to, to help with these decisions. And even during this time, she kept coming to her mom and going, well, mom, what, what should we do? What do, what do you want? And that, that was fine for as long as mom could do it. But as she got sicker and sicker, she, she wasn't able to make those decisions anymore. And it would have been wonderful if the whole family had, had been able to talk about that ahead of time and known what mom wanted. Because it just made it very um, stressful for the family during that time. A third snapshot that I want you to see was of a family of eight siblings adult siblings in their, their 30s to 50s, young 50s, and they were a very close family, and they, one of their brothers in, in this family had been diagnosed with a severe brain tumor. And he got care and did, did well for a while, but then he started talking with his siblings about what he didn't want when he died. And so by the time it got to kind of a crisis where he was no longer, like Dr. Pender said, 
was no longer able to make decisions, and the family started talking about what their brother would have wanted, different segments of the family had heard him very differently, and they had never had an opportunity to talk together with him about it. So the way I got introduced to this situation is I was called to a, a family meeting with the neuro, neurosurgeon in the family to try to figure out what was the best, what would, what would be the choice that they would make together that would bring some unity. And it was a very difficult time. I'm, I'm only bringing this situation because I, I just really saw it there the importance of even once the conversation is had, how important it is to share that conversation with all of those in the family that, that maybe need to know about it. Because if there's, if there's, that's not a time to have, you know, be unsure and to be um, questioning, because it can bring a lot more complication and, and even some complicated grief to the situation. The fourth snapshot I want to share with you is, is my family, as, as was mentioned before, I came back to Montana because our parents were diagnosed with Alzheimer's and my dad especially had some other complicating pro problems. And um, I, you know, we were, there's five, there's five adults in our family that are siblings and um, we were very grateful that we weren't grateful at the time. We weren't 13, but we were young when our parents had, uh, for some reason, uh, worked with a lawyer and put some things in writing of what they wanted. And they told us, now not many of us paid attention at that young age, but it was in writing, we knew it was there. And as, as their health got, got um, worse, those, we, we talked about those things that they wanted. And, you know, I just, one of the things that we really learned by working on this together, and I throw this out because I know some, some of you may be dealing with people with dementia and other kinds of complicating issues. You know, if some of the basic decisions are known ahead of time, and if, if your loved ones or your, your kids understand your values, any decisions that are already made is great because there's always gonna be more decisions that need to be made that we don't anticipate. Because there's not just one decision about death. It's, there, there, there's always many. So anything that can be communicated can be really helpful to others. Next, we'll hear from Diane Arcava. So the goal of these discussions is to have the best life possible. And so uh, my topic here is to how to approach this discussion with somebody. And as you can tell, I'm not really an expert. <laughs> But I've sure had to do a lot of it in my work uh, over the past 12 years with the palliative care team here at Billings Clinic. And um, I'm with my own family as well. Um, you guys remember the comic Gary Larson? Remember like why the dinosaurs became extinct? They were smoking. And there's a comic of his where uh, there's this guy and he's coming into heaven and St. Peter's greeting him and he's going like this. He's saying, good death, good death. And, uh, <laughs> That's what I want, and uh, that's what I want for the people that I love, and I think that's what we all want, is a good death. And so for each of us, that's going to be different, but mostly we want a good life, too. So that's a great way, actually, to start a conversation, is to, uh, I'll, I'll share a story. My dad died last year of uh, complications related to Parkinson's, and um, my sister's a nurse, and my sister and my dad's wife waited for me to come to visit to have the discussion. And because they said, Diane knows how to do this. So I got there and uh, it was really an amazing discussion because my dad, I said, Dad, what's really important to you? And he said, well, it's really important for me to be outside. And we knew that. Of course we knew that, but 
But we didn't know until he told us that it was really what was important to him. We knew what we thought because we saw what it was like for him to be outside. And uh, he said, if there comes a time when I can't be outside anymore, then I don't think that there's much point in living. And then we did all of the, we did the five wishes, and uh, we didn't do the post at that point, which you're going to learn more about from Dr. Lokamp. But um, we, uh, that conversation really stayed with us all. And as my dad's disease worsened and he, my, his wife decided to bring him home with hospice because in their house they had some big windows that he could look outside. And then the week that he died, my sister told me that she had wheeled him outside and he didn't even know where he was. He didn't know that he was outside anymore. And she, a nurse that works in a big hospital in Seattle, revisited that conversation so many times and it helped her. She said, once I took him outside and I saw that he didn't know he was outside, then I knew it was all right for him to go. It gave her such a sense of peace, <laughs> such a sense of peace. So uh, I don't think it matters that much how you start the conversation, but it doesn't have to be scary. It can be, it can be happy. It can be about what's important to you. Uh, what do you, what do you love the most? Let's do more of that. Sometimes in our supportive and palliative care, people say, hey, I really want to go on a trip. And we say, "Let's. you should do it. Do it now. <laughs> do it while you can. There's also some tools out there. This is a uh, card game, which you'll be hearing more about, uh, because there's the guy, one of the people from this company is going to come and help us learn about all the ways to learn it. I'm not trying to sell the game, but they gave me a free copy of it, so I've been using it. It's called My Gift of Grace, and it's a conversation uh, game for living and dying. And I don't know about the game part of it, but I've had people just pull out cards, and they've got things on them like, uh, what do you think happens to you after you leave this life? What are the first three words you think of when you hear the word hospice? In the movie The Princess Bride, Buttercup realizes that every time Wesley says, as you wish, what he really means is, I love you. What is a similar code phrase that someone you know uses to say, I love you? See, those are pretty nice things. And when we, when we can uh, lift up the connection that we have in the face of the fear, then the love becomes bigger. And so however you have these conversations, have them in a way that you feel safe and connected. And, um, and if you need help, we can help you with it. Your doctor can help you with it. There are people here that can help you with those discussions. Dr. Allen? Well, I think we've heard um, a good bit about, about the value and, and importance of doing this and, and how to, to kind of just get the ball rolling and get the conversation started. And <clears throat> when I think about what to, what to actually have and to talk about in this conversation, um, I kind of break, break that down and, and keep this simple. It can start to feel really, really complicated and really technical and lots of other medical pieces. Um, do many people here remember the show Seinfeld TV? Okay. So there's a, there's a Seinfeld episode where Kramer is going through this process and trying to complete a living will. And they pick Elaine as the most ruthless of their friends who will follow to the letter whatever he says. And they're going down this exhaustive list of like, if you can use these three fingers, but not this fourth one, and see from your left eye, and taste, but not hear, what do you think? And, and you start to think about medicine like that, and you're just like, I, I just don't know. I, I don't know these things about medicine, or, or you can, you're trying to plan for every specific situation. Um, you don't need to do that, OK? Um, patients and people know themselves. They know what's important to them. Healthcare providers in the hospital knows medicine. And what we really want to try to have happen is to be able to bring those two things together and then have that right path and the right, the right decision there become clear. And that's to be able to enlighten other people about, you know, this is how I make decisions, this is what's important, this is what I value. And then be able to have your healthcare provider give you that medical recommendation, say, okay, of the options we have before us, I think this one can help us do that the most. And, and try to work together there in partnership. So when you're starting to have this conversation, um, and you're asking, what questions do I ask and otherwise? I think there's two big categories, okay? There's questions you ask to help figure out 
what you or your loved one thinks about this. So for most people, this isn't something where if you even ask me right now, I could just lay this out very specifically there. It happens through conversation. And so those are a lot of the questions that, that Diane was bringing up there, which are that, what are the things that are most important to you? Is there something that's so important to you that if you couldn't do it anymore, you would feel that life wasn't worth living? Okay. Um, and then after that, to kind of focus on, rather than medical minutia, some of the other things that I actually find and think are impactful for people. You know, one of those is sort of environment, and that's, you know, being at home or not being at home, okay? Um, you know, level of sort of dependency and kind of care on other people, and that's maybe dependency on medical interventions or just on the required care of other people, okay? Um, and that as you start to kind of figure out sort of those pieces, I think it's easier to step forward than a little bit into, okay, and so, so that sounds like this is what's important to you, or this is otherwise, and then we, you can kind of move to that next step of maybe understanding specific situations a little more. Another, I think, really good piece to share with people is that um, who's the right advocate for you if you're not able to speak? or if someone else is asking you to be in that position, how, um, how much leeway do you have there? Uh, these can be really stressful. And, and I can say working either as a single individual for someone who you care about and having seen that, or working with a large group of other people, those dynamics and those family stressors can be enormous. And so trying to help provide um, people with a sense of the, the leeway that they should have and figuring out and making those other decisions. And that might be what I would tell my wife, which is that, you know, one of the things that matters most to me is that she feels at peace with whatever decision she would make, okay? And that I want her to know that it actually matters more to me that she feels comfortable, she lives with that, and it's right for her and my kids, than it's necessarily exactly the specific thing that, that I would have said there. And then I want her to kind of have that leeway. And, and I also know that I think that she's comfortable bearing some of that burden. But there are some people out there, and, there's, and this is very common as well, where, where having that burden of decision making feels really challenging, okay? And if you've identified that kind of as you, that you know, I, I really, I know what I want, and I want that, and I'm very specific about it, or you're trying to advocate for someone else, and you're saying, you know, I just don't know if I can feel comfortable in a position feeling like I'm being asking to make decisions, then those are good situations to know maybe now is a better time to have a more specific document to kind of take this initial values-based conversation we had, come and sit down with our doctor and try to translate that into something more specific and then that we have a, uh, something that we can go to and look to and say, well, here this is here and, and, I, and I understand that then. And so I, I think when you're trying to have that conversation, those three things that I'm thinking about are Building a conversation so that you can even figure out yourself what's important, okay? Then kind of trying to translate that into the, the values and pieces that start to matter in medicine, you know, dependency on others, environment you receive your care in, um, invasiveness or other discomfort. And then lastly, looking at how much um, leeway the people who people are gonna be talking to um, should have. Um, and, and that works from both perspectives, whether you're the person who's making that decision or you're the person who's asking someone else to do that. And that it's not always enough to just tell people I, the, what can be a very true answer, but can be very challenging, which is the, you know what to do, okay? And that uh, that's very burdensome some of the time. And that you can say, you know, you know what to do, and if we're gonna only, if that's all you can get to, to add to that, hopefully, and I'm comfortable and okay with whatever that decision is. I want you to be at peace about that as well, okay? And ideally you should kind of use that and build on it and have some other pieces there, but giving people another family that comfort and that latitude can be valuable. And, and I'll just comment that if you're the only medical person in a large family, it always winds up being you who gets tasked with these decisions. And, Sometimes you have to figure out how you really feel about that. Last, uh, we're going to hear from Dr. Lowcamp. Hello, thank you for coming. 
No, usually when I'm in the office, I'm the one that's initiating these discussions. But I want to give you some ideas on how you can initiate the discussion. First of all, advanced care planning is that piece of paper that you sign that says, well, if my condition is terminal and on and on and on, I would not want extraordinary means. Well, that's fine for when you're 20, 30, 40, 50, but it doesn't really tell the people around you or your family what that means to you and what's really going on. But it starts the discussion. And it works fine until you get close to the end of life, until you have a serious illness where you're looking at less than 10 years or five years or less than that. Um, and when you start moving into a serious illness, then there are a lot of different ways to kind of approach the discussion and approach how you can start to think about it. And you know, you could start out by just talking with your doctor. And a lot of times, I was a family doctor for 25 years and almost never talked about people dying. You know, I just it didn't get there. I didn't have time. I had I was trying to tweak their CHF or fix their diabetes or you know all those things. Um, so you almost, if the doctor doesn't initiate it, you really have to stop and think about initiating it yourself. Then the first thing to ask yourself is, do I really want to know? And if I really want to know, what do I want to know? How much do I want to know? You know, do I want my husband to be there when I find out? Do I want my child to be there and hear the story? So that's, that's kind of the first thing is, how much do you want to know? And then you just ask, you know. You ask, uh, how serious is this? However you want to phrase it. Hey, Doc, how much time have I got left? You know, there's a, you know, a lot of funny ways to introduce it and a lot of serious ways to introduce it. Um, so first is just asking, deciding what you want to ask, what you want to know, and just making that first step. Uh, the other things that you would want to ask are what's already been addressed, you know, what's you know, what is this going to mean for my life? What does it mean if I have, you know, as you get further along in your illness and you get more sicker, then you might start thinking, okay, what does it mean if I'm intubated? What does that mean, you know, am I going to be able to get off the machine and talk about, you know, how bad am I? Would I able, be able to get off of a, a ventilator? And then as people get sicker, they, you know, they're not eating. Do we do a feeding tube? So you have to ask, okay, what, what does this mean? You know, am I ever going to get off a feeding tube? Uh, so ask questions, um, and you can only do so much ahead of time. And when you're, when you're healthy and you're jogging 10 miles a day, you're going to ask a different question than when you go in in a wheelchair and with an oxygen hooked up to you. you know? So it's, it's a different discussion on where you are. And if you're the one taking your loved one into the doctor in a wheelchair, you might want to ask them ahead of time, hey, do you want to find out what's, you know, can we find out how you're doing? Can we find out what's coming ahead? So it's just thinking ahead about what you want to know and planning ahead. There are some easy ways to kind of jump into it, you might say. I think the five wishes is really kind of a, it's daunting, but on the other hand, if there's the questions in here are kind of cute, <laughs> all right? So you can offer these to families who are kind of leery of really approaching the issue. And you can just give a family of five wishes and say, hey, why don't you all just go through this this weekend and uh, see how much of this you can answer. And I think a really funny part is it talks about who do you want there. And then in another section it says, who do you not want there? <laughs> so this is your chance. Okay? <laughs> all right. So I think this is very valuable, uh, particularly when you're kind of trying to get your feet warm you know, on it. Um, so when you get that far, and then you get to where, you know, this is a pulsed. I don't talk to everybody about pulsed. This is, this is the form where it's a doctor's order, and it says, do you want to be resuscitated or not? Do you want to go to the ICU? Do you want to just be hospitalized? Or do you want to just stay home and, be comf and ha have comfort care and do whatever you can do at home? Do you want a feeding tube? So I mean, this to me is when you're getting, you know, you're looking at limited lifespan, like less than five years. It's kind of how I mentally think of it. And 
when you know, when I know my patients, I kind of get a feel for when they're ready to talk about it too. So this is when you're sick or getting, or you're being given a diagnosis of a chronic illness that's not going to get better, where they're just tweaking things, you know, like end-stage emphysema, where you're um, oxygen dependent and on prednisone, or end-stage CHF, where you can't even walk across the room without getting short of breath. I mean, this, and, and your doctor can even suggest when this is happening. And it varies with people. Some people have severe heart disease and they have to think about whether they want to be resuscitated a lot sooner than someone who doesn't have heart disease because you don't know when your heart's going to stop. Um, so I kind of consider this almost an individual decision. And when you're interested in talking about this, your doctor will talk about what all these things mean. Now, you know what resuscitation is, right? You've all watched ER, right, on TV. So you know it's the you know, on the chest and the shocking and all of that. And you have to explain that in different words with people because I, it depends on their level of medical sophistication as far as what they would understand. And allow natural death is right under do not resuscitate. So sometimes that's an easier thing to understand. So this is, these are some of the decisions that you make as you get sicker or you may have family members already who are at the point where they really should be thinking about do they want to be resuscitated. And I tell folks, okay, I mean, they're sitting there talking to me, they're doing great. I said, if you walk out the, my door and you collapse on the ground right now, do you want to be resuscitated? And we have that discussion. And then with the pulse, there are also the levels of care so you could decide you don't want to be resuscitated. You know, if your heart stops, just let it stop. But most people who fall down and pass out or don't have their heart stop, <laughs> okay? So then you have to decide, okay, do you want to go to the ER? Do you want to go to the ICU? Uh, how much care do you want? Do you want to, um, maybe if you have like a pneumonia, you can go into the hospital and get treated for that. So there's like these levels of how hard you push. And then comfort care basically is, for people who really just don't want to ever darken the door of an ER again or a hospital again. I mean, there are folks who are in the hospital every two weeks or every month for a year or for years who after a while it's, okay, this isn't getting fixed. <laughs> I'm just, come, you know. So, and that's an example of one type of person who would want to just be comfort and just treat me wherever I'm at, just take care of me there, and if I make it, that's great. And then the feeding tube issue is a whole other, you know, discussion. And it depends on what the medical circumstances are.